All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Eric Nelson. I live in Pendleton, Oregon. I own and farm a little shy of 900 acres. It is all certified organic, certified by Oregon Tilth. Uh, I, started the, I started the transition process in about 2005. In 2010, the whole farm was organic. Pendleton is located in the northeast corner of the state of Oregon. We're about 200 miles east of Portland, 200 miles south of Spokane. A quick comment about the pictures. All the background pictures are from our farm, either crops, uh, landscaping or crops. And you have to see my, my two daughters and a nephew in one of these pictures. So this is actually a picture of Mount Adams, which is about 100 to 130 miles to our west from our farm in the state of Washington. Our environment, we're dry land farming. It's summer fallow, winter wheat rotation. We average 12 inches of rainfall a year. 80% of that falls between the months of October and May, the, the non-growing months. We average 160 frost-free days of the year. Our elevation of our farm is 14 to 1,500 feet. Our soil type is a wall wall silt loam. It's pretty level, 0 to 7% slope. Our winter crops yield twice as much as our spring crops on average. We do have mild winters. We can't have mild winters. We can be planting winter wheat in January and February. Of course, we always have our inversions in the winter, which we have our, in our cold, foggy, uh, with high humidity. That's always a common factor. Our spring crops, we plant between March 1st and April 15th. Anything after the 15th of April gets hit. Uh, the yield gets su can suffer due to the high temperatures in May, June, and July. We call it the high evapotranspiration rates. And that really affects flowering, especially of broadleaf crops. We harvest in mid-July almost every year. This past year was an extremely wet year, and we still harvested on the 25th of July. My system, I used dryland alfalfa primarily for my conversion process. I planted Laydac, uh, Montana public variety. For me, it was a minimum five-year process. First year, I would establish the crop. I, did, I did, not, did not take a crop off that year. The next three years, I would take off the alfalfa cutting. The last year, I'd create summer fallow. Over those five years, I've averaged one cutting and about a ton to the acre. I do not own any haying equipment, so I had a 50% lease agreement with somebody else to do all the work for me. I liked alfalfa as a transition crop. However, I did not sell very often to the dairies because we never made quality. As you can see by the picture, we have a lot of cheatgrass. That's a timing issue. Cheatgrass heads out in late May or middle May, and we're not swathing until sometime in June. This year, we decided to be a little more aggressive about that. We just have a lot more in-crop tillage. We use a rolling harrow. Then we also use a Danish thyme. Uh, and so in about a two-week period, we went over the field four times. And we crisscrossed different directions. We cleaned it up. We were able to sell for dairy quality this year. We custom grazed sheep uh, on the regrowth from July to October. And surprisingly, with all this cheatgrass, because I can find the cheatgrass in the windrows in the successive years of alfalfa, but I haven't seen it yet in the winter wheat crops, which really surprises me. The crops that we grow, dry and alfalfa, soft white winter wheat, Spring barley, we have grown some, tried to grow some DNSs, but we can never make protein, so we've abandoned that idea. When we buy our inputs, we buy 500 pounds of perfect blend. We use the 442 formulation. It's bought, delivered, and spread at about $80 an acre. We try to apply that in the fall, so after these last few talks, I might have to reconsider what I'm doing with that. Rotations, it's a work in progress still for us. Uh, originally, I think I'm doing a five-year rotation of alfalfa, then going to spring grains for four or five years, then back into uh, alfalfa. We want to probably abandon that idea. Uh, the, uh, what we're doing now is in the fall of the year, after we, uh, the alfalfa will we'll undercut it. I'm sorry, we'll rip it first and undercut it, and we'll create summer fallow, and then we'll go into a three-year rotation of a winter crop, a spring crop, and then a summer fallow. If we have enough moisture in the winter months after we take out the alfalfa, once again, we're ripping it and then we're cutting it in the fall. If we, have, if we have enough moisture, we'll come back with the spring crop immediately that next spring. Then we'll go into a summer fallow and then back into our three-year rotation. Now it's winter wheat, spring barley, summer fallow. Now that rotation I'm talking about is not very diverse. There's no broadleaves in that rotation. There's no legumes in that rotation. All we're doing is buying inputs. So we need to find a good spring crop so that possibly we can do a number five down here, a different rotation. We do a winter crop and come in with a spring crop like a green manure which would be our broadleaf and obviously a legume. 
and then come up with a spring crop, and then maybe a summer fallow, and we can do that back to back to make it like an eight-year rotation, but sort of use that same pattern uh, over, over and over again. Weed control. Crop rotations is our, is our main management tool, and it seems to us in our area the spring crop is the, is the key part of that rotation. It really addresses the cool season uh, weeds that we have, primarily cheatgrass, goatgrass, Jim Hill mustard, and purple and blue mustards. When we seed uh, winter wheat, we prefer to go into summer fallow. We deep furrow it, get an early stand in September. We seed a little bit heavier than normal, one and a half times our normal rate. So usually we we're seeding about a bushel to the acre. We're now we're seeding at 90 pounds. Now we're on 14-inch spacings on our deep furrow drills, and so there's still some the canopy can't cover that in the winter quick enough for us. Uh, so we're doing some in every time row cropping the winter wheat. And I got this idea from Ian Burke and Dennis Pittman. That, oops. Okay, there we go. At the, the Wazoo, Washington State University fields. The work, this is the whole part of my whole program right here. This is the, this was it, the climax. And so it's a, it's a three-point hitch, okay, it's made by Sunco. Uh, and it's called an AccuTrack, and it's, it's got solenoids on it, basically, hydraulics that will move the three-point hitch based upon a ground sensor. Now, you saw this earlier with, um, was it Misha? I'm sorry, Christy, my bad. My bad. So she showed an example of that, but I saw this first uh, a year and a half ago at, at the Boyd Farm. Uh, they weren't able to demonstrate it. Ian and Dennis weren't able to demonstrate it. That was demonstrated. Exactly right. This doesn't count against my timing, is it? And what we're doing basically, there's a ground sensor, okay, and it follows the furrow. We're using heavy balls that they were using the wands, but we're using a little heavier device that's in the furrow, these deep furrow drills. And as the furrow moves, then the three-point hitch moves, and we have built a toolbar that fits on this. And so we're basically row cropping winter wheat. Now, hopefully, at some point, we won't have to do this because our rotations are such that there's no weeds there. But at this point in time, there are weeds, and so this is what we're trying. This is how we're trying to accomplish this. What we're going to hopefully see here is a springtime. This past spring, um, this past week, I was out in the field working this year's planted planted winter wheat. I can't remember how many days we had on that. It must have been it must have been two or three tiller at this point in time, and so. It's an experiment, and uh, we have no idea how it's going to turn out until next spring. I'll press on that, yeah, do that. I swear it worked last night. Oh, that's too bad. Well, we can. Uh, hey, Gail, can you go? Uh, no, it's going to be in the computer bag in the car. Of course. Okay. No, I cannot sing. I'm tone deaf. You wouldn't want me to sing, no. 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 Uh, what else can I talk about? Um, so we had to build a custom toolbar. We had to custom build the shanks. We're worried about throwing too much dirt onto the wheel, onto the wheat. All right. Thank you, Ian. So this is the spring. Uh, this is the toolbar that we had to custom build. It matches our drills, which are HZ, John Deere HZ split packers. This is blue mustard and purple mustard, winter wheat. I planted the previous fall. Obviously, we should work this the previous fall, but we weren't set up to work it the previous fall. A better farmer than me would have taken this out, taken the insurance money, and planted a spring crop. But, but I wanted to find out what was going to happen. So, so here's the sensor on the ground. That's how that works. And so it's an electronics sensor that goes to uh, electronics on the three-point hitch, which moves hydraulics back and forth. And if it works well, this is what it looks like. So we're row cropping winter wheat. Yeah, nine inch, 14 inch spacings. That's a nine inch, nine inches right there. It's really shallow, so we don't throw very much dirt. And, and that's what we're using. This is what it looks like a month after. A lot of that stuff's reset, obviously, so we gotta work on some different strategies there. But anecdotally, there is a difference. 
And we had a lot of rust this year, so scientifically, all of our yields are the same. So this is what it looks like uh, before harvest, a month before harvest, two, two months after it being worked. So thanks to Ian and Dennis. That's row cropping winter wheat. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. I... Oh, I'm not quite done, unfortunately. <laughs> I just got started. Uh, right. So what's um the next question is what's worked? Good fertility fall on alfalfa, cover crops in our inputs. Uh, we have a rotation with Oregon State University that works very well in terms of controlling weeds. It's a spring wheat, spring barley, spring cover crop rotation. This is it. This is the picture in the background. That's a pretty, that's this year's spring crop. It's a soft white uh, spring wheat, pretty clean. In the transition phase, we like spring cropping. Fall tillage. We like to do fall tillage. It makes our spring load less. And even though, even if there's nothing growing out in the field, we can see a difference come the following spring if, if we do tillage or don't do tillage. So we we do like fall tillage. Marketing and networking. Someone has to buy what you're growing. So you've got to get out there and make some phone calls and see if someone can buy what you're growing. Or you've got to grow what they want to buy. Or what, yeah, some, yes. What's not worked? So far, weeds in the winter wheat. You know, will it ever, will it ever end? Intercropping in the spring has not worked for us. We've tried yellow blossom sea clover, black medic. We've tried alfalfa. We've had a terrible time, really poor time establishing uh, those intercrops. So we've abandoned that idea. Winter wheat in the transition years. Too many weeds, too high dockage, too low of a price. Too tight of a rotation. Water is a limiting factor in our area. If we plant a green manure in the spring and plow it down, normally we don't have enough moisture to plant that winter wheat. We have to go to the following spring to guarantee a pretty good crop. And then alfalfa is a main crop rotation. The economics, you know, one ton per acre, just doesn't really pay a lot of bills in our situation. We might have to do some tweaking of that system, but we're also getting away from the alfalfa as a main crop. Final thoughts. What's your crop rotation? And do you have a spring crop, a broadleaf, preferably in that rotation that'll work for you? On farm storage. The people you're selling to don't have enough storage to take all your crop, let alone everybody else's crop they're buying. So on farm storage is a strong consideration. Stripe rust. Do your research on the seeds that you're using and, and pick a, a seed that has a good disease package. If you're giving up some yield for that seed, that's that's okay. It's probably worthwhile to do something like that. First impressions and not and not uh, prescriptive. In other words, first impressions, we really have no idea what the results are going to be until after we've already completed the experiment. You know, we're going into it kind of blind. And it's not prescriptive. It may work this year, but it may not work next year. Which leads me to my last point. You have to enjoy the challenge. I mean, it's a steep learning curve to do organics, a little bit more management, and you have to be creative in finding the solutions. Thank you for your time and your patience.